Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is 8.15 a.m. Uh, my name is Marina Dobrovolskaya. I'm with Nanotechnology Characterization Lab, and I'm joined here with Professor Janusz Zibeni from Semmelweis University. Uh, Janusz and I uh, will be co-chairing this uh, session. Uh, our session title is Immunological Complications of COVID Vaccination. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we will be posting questions from the audience uh, into the chat box uh, for the speakers to answer. Each speaker has 15 minutes. Um, and so what we will do, if speaker uses uh, 15 minutes, then we will keep these questions for the debate room. But if uh, at the end of the presentation, speakers still have a few minutes left, then we will use this minutes, uh, three minutes for discussion. So with this, let me announce our first speaker. Uh, it is Professor Zibini, uh, head of the Nanomedicine Research and Education Center at the Semmelweis University in Budapest. And the title of his presentation is Allergic Reactions to COVID Vaccines. Janusz, please share your screen and the microphone is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Marina. Good morning, everybody uh, who joined uh, this session today. Uh, let me see. Do you? Is it possible to see my screen? Um, was it? Yes. Is it shared? Uh, yes, we see your screen, but uh, not in presentation mode. And now. Yes, now it's in the presentation mode. You are good to go. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, Marina has announced the, my title, but uh, I extended this title a little bit um, to make the presentation um, more focused uh, on uh, allergic reactions, not only to all uh, um, COVID vaccines, but also to um, LNP, MRI, MRA based. Uh, uh, vaccines, uh, namely the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. And what I'm going to talk about <clears throat> uh, will be, um, many of you know that uh, we are dealing with a complement system for a very long time recently um, with the anti-PEG antibodies uh, and their role in, this, um, uh, in, the, in these reactions. And uh, <clears throat> we have a uh, porcine model, which is uh, uh, an issue of debate for many. Anyhow, um, I cannot do anything else, only present our data, recent data. Um, and let me go to the outline of my presentation, uh, which tells us what I'm going to talk about more precisely. Namely, uh, <clears throat> a few words in general about the adverse effects of COVID-19 vaccines and the rationales behind the experimental studies that we have carried out uh, on allergic reactions, uh, pig studies and human studies. Uh, we measured the physiological changes uh, of, uh, in pigs after IV injection of community. Of course, it is a vaccine which is given uh, IM, but as you will see, uh, the IV uh, approach uh, reveals things which uh, were not expected. Uh, we, are, we were measuring complement activation by the vaccines uh, in pig serum and also in human serum. Um, we measured uh, anti-pig antibodies in human and, and pig serum uh, and complement activation also um, by the vaccines uh, in human serum. And then come up with, a con with conclusions on the mechanism and not only the mechanism, but also about this uh, anti-pig assay uh, what it could uh, do, how it could help us. In general, about adverse effects of COVID vaccines, um, Patrick Hunziker in his first uh, lecture has already listed um, uh, the main adverse effects of these vaccines, which include um, the acute or subacute and chronic allergic uh, side reactions. We also refer to those as hypersanitary reactions uh, uh, whose worst manifestation is anaphylaxis. And <clears throat> there are uh, a lot of skin uh, problems after vaccinations, uh, um, uh, 
kind of new phenomenon called chronic urticaria uh, came upon, came to the front of interest for many. Then we hear about myocarditis, uh, venous thrombosis, thrombopenic purpura, nerve disorders like the guillain barre syndrome. Anyhow, um, I have, there's no time to talk about all these. Um, I will focus on the allergy, um, as I mentioned already. And <clears throat> there is a reason um, why uh, it might be important uh, to talk about these things, not only the uh, success of the vaccines, which is unambiguous, the uh, vaccine uh, saved millions of lives, but uh, those who undergo some side effects um, cannot be comforted by the fact that the side effects are very rare. And actually they are very rare, but when uh, side effects uh, and serious side effects come up, then it, it makes the, uh, the public, um, uh, public attention. Uh, and the few examples are, are listed here uh, for <clears throat> um, allergic reactions uh, hitting the press. Uh, I obviously not uh, going, these are just illustrative uh, things, how it looks in the, in the press. And uh, uh, two examples uh, of skin eruptions which show up uh, a day or, or uh, sometimes uh, much later um, in, uh, people, in people's skin. And sometimes uh, these symptoms are much worse than, than these shown. So uh, it is a problem that um, needs to be addressed at least by some, some people. Regarding the prevalence of these uh, reactions, um, there is huge discrepancy in the literature about uh, the exact numbers. In general, um, it has been absolutely recognized that um, for other um, traditional vaccines, uh, the occurrence of anaphylaxis is very rare, like um, 1.3 men, I guess it's not possible, one or two men in a million. And uh, uh, obviously, that's almost negligible. Nobody has heard about uh, side effect of a, of a flu shot, but it has already been recognized and um, that uh, the occurrence is a little bit higher uh, for the COVID vaccines. And the numbers here uh, are uh, greatly differing. Uh, the official CDC number uh, is about four to uh, two to four in a million. which uh, has been recognized by, well recognized by the um, um, majority, but there are other reports um, which show much higher figures like uh, the studies listed here, uh, 250, 270 in a million. Um, uh, we are uh, going to listen to Dr. Nagyos, um, Kerry Nagyos lecture who has published uh, um, in, in her paper uh, like um, about 400 uh, reactions uh, in a million. Anyhow, um, what, what, um, what has been the most recent figure uh, is, this, um, is this paper here, uh, anaphylaxis rates, which, which is an, um, a very uh, interesting paper because the title absolutely contradicts the, the data, what they show. Uh, they show here um, anaphylactic reactions um, like um, 12 in a million for community, um, a, uh, some of which is anaphylactic shock uh, and death also occurs. Um, they give, uh, this paper gives account of death, which is, uh, uh, which uh, the figures here uh, show the death rate. And for spike wax, the Moderna vaccine, vaccine um, the, the figures are also much higher, at least 10, 20 fold than the acknowledged official figure. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's a very few, very few number if you consider the enormous benefit what the vaccine does. <coughs> um, what, what were the motivation that uh, we came to study this uh, problem, um, there, there were a few. One was that we recognized, um, as detailed in this uh, recent review article, 
that the symptoms of these reactions are very similar to the symptoms of infusion reactions where nanoparticles are infused uh, uh, to, to people and develop uh, symptoms like listed here uh, on the uh, upper right panel, which is a, a figure um, in this review article. So it was uh, already suspicious that uh, these symptoms are the same, although uh, allergic reactions in general do not have, do not share the same symptoms uh, so frequently. And then another uh, thing which was revealing regarding the, um, um, the similarity between the vaccine induced side effect and the nanoparticles in general was that the vaccine contains PEG. And we know and have been studying for a long time uh, the toxicity of pegylated liposomes. Uh, we came to the uh, conclusion that they activate the complement, they can activate the complement and uh, can cause uh, infusion reactions which can be mimicked uh, in pigs. So we had a kind of uh, experience in, the, in this. Um, it was a deja vu uh, um, phenomenon when we uh, heard about these anaphylactic reactions uh, right at the beginning of the vaccination campaign um, in uh, two years ago in December in, in London. So we have uh, all this equipment and approaches to study the phenomenon. Uh, uh, we have anti-PEG antibody ELISA's complement tests. We have the porcine model. Um, obviously we started to uh, pursue this idea that the reactions uh, can be attributed uh, to PEG and complement activation, at least in part. And I cannot emphasize it enough already now that we never claim that it is only complement uh, that causes the re reactions. What we claim is that complement is playing a role, a permissive or a contributing role, but it is not uh, uh, the main driver of these reactions. Uh, these are the experiments uh, in pigs with pegylated liposomes, uh, which led us uh, to all these concepts. Uh, we published this data, namely that uh, when pigs are uh, treated with uh, uh, doxibo, the placebo do doxil, uh, IV, a very small amount, uh, in, in matters of days, they develop uh, anti-peg antibodies against these uh, particles peaking uh, around um, uh, week, num week uh, one, and then the antibodies decaying over many, many weeks, up to uh, uh, five, six weeks. And interestingly here, uh, it is mainly IgM what is produced, uh, less uh, IgG, but uh, on the log scale, you can see that IgG is also produced. Now, when <clears throat> uh, pigs uh, are injected with uh, doxibo, uh, these empty pegylated liposomes. The pigs which uh, display these very high uh, antibody levels, uh, the experiment is done at, at this time when the antibody peaks, then uh, immediately anaphylaxis develops, a huge anaphylaxis. These animals can, uh, has to be uh, salvaged in order to uh, live further. Um, in, in matters of minutes, um, this anaphylaxis develops. And uh, also there are severe uh, skin reactions. Um, and <clears throat> just to compare this to this, this is um, the uh, reaction in pigs to uh, naive pigs to uh, the, the doxibo, the pegylated liposomes. Uh, we see the rise of pulmonary arterial pressure, but by far not uh, as much uh, as we see it uh, here, you can see. And uh, we, usually we do not see any major changes in the systemic arterial pressure in naive pigs, but in, uh, in uh, pigs made allergic uh, to these uh, uh, nanoparticles, we see huge reaction. And importantly, we also see a complement activation go, going hand in hand with the rise of pulmonary arterial pressure. So although this finding does not prove that complement is causal in the reaction, but at least the two are uh, going together. Uh, they, are they, they are paralleling phenomena. <clears throat> when we um, uh, tried to mimic these experiments and gave uh, injected pigs um, with, uh, uh, with uh, Comirnaty, the um, uh, Pfizer vaccine, we, we saw um, 
uh, similar changes as, as we see uh, in uh, uh, with Dox, Doxibo. And Laszlo, uh, in his uh, following lecture, will uh, give a detailed account of these experiments. <clears throat> Here, uh, I'd like to press only that only one out of 14 animals show the reaction, which is kind of um, corresponds that very few people out of millions uh, show the reaction. But here, uh, uh, there is something important uh, about which Laszlo will not uh, talk, that uh, incubation, incubating the liposomes uh, with pig serum uh, resulted um, huge complement activation. Uh, the, this is um, <clears throat> the upper panels uh, show uh, dose dependence of the phenomenon. And this is particularly uh, interesting because uh, Zymazen, which is the uh, uh, gold standard for complement activation, given at a much higher uh, concentration than CMT or, or community, uh, cause similar reaction, which indicates that these vaccines or this vaccine is a very strong complement activator of which we hear uh, of actually nothing uh, uh, to my best knowledge. <clears throat> so then we switch to, to, to man, to humans, because um, uh, it is not the pig who is um, uh, uh, vaccinated against COVID, but the people. And if uh, PEG plays any role in this reaction, then uh, we, we must see its um, level rising in people. So we were uh, <clears throat> engaging uh, in testing uh, anti-PEG antibodies uh, in, in men, people uh, who were recruited to come to our lab for uh, other purposes, namely uh, determining the neutralizing antibody against COVID. So the, the real attractive um, 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 source for their coming was this uh, antibody assay against COVID, but they also agreed to give their blood for our uh, um, anti-PEG antibody assay. And here is what we found. You can see on the bottom that um, there is a huge um, variation in the distribution, uh, very much left skewed with uh, a few very, very high values. And <clears throat> this was um, true for IgM, but also for IgG. When we um, illustrate these um, titers uh, on a log scale, um, uh, we get a, a normal log distribution, which allows um, um, statistical analysis and also shows that uh, this um, distribution, this uh, unusual distribution is a natural phenomenon. It cannot be a, an assay problem. So uh, we found people, um, this is about uh, 10 to 20, whose levels were extremely high. And uh, th these people in the top, uh, the, the titers, the uh, absolute levels of anti-PEG antibody corresponds to, to those seen in pigs which reacted. So then <clears throat> the next question, whether um, uh, community also activates complement in human sera and whether this uh, complement activation correlates in any way uh, with um, anti-PEG antibody level uh, in human serum. And here is an experiment um, where we did this, all this compari uh, comparison and we found indeed that um, uh, community activated complement here, uh, you, you, you compare the empty bars, the PBS control uh, with the red community, but we also looked at uh, Moderna and Doxibo, uh, the um, placebo Doxil, the liposomes, and uh, so that uh, um, uh, Moderna is even a, a stronger activator uh, than, um, than um, the Pfizer vaccine. And we see it with C3A, the C5A, the anaphylotoxin. And here are the conclusions. Uh, there is no way to go um, de in the details, but uh, uh, we see a, a minimum of a trend uh, for uh, anaphylotoxin uh, production and in some cases, significant uh, activation. Spike vax, the uh, Moderna vaccine is more active. Uh, it was the strongest complement activator of all. The same changes are observed for uh, <clears throat> Uh, C5A and C3A. And uh, it, it was seen uh, mainly in, in those sera, these sera are selected uh, for high anti-PEG anti antibody levels. When we use sera with very low, then there is no activation. 
Uh, this um, study does shows that anti-PEG antibody do play a role uh, in these activations uh, by both uh, um, pegylated vaccines. And the same is true for C3A, C5A, all, although there are a little uh, differences. And uh, now uh, I speed up because I see the, the time passing very much. So uh, uh, we see the same thing. Uh, these are the uh, um, experiments what um, Laszlo will talk about, uh, the reaction in pigs. And then uh, we compared uh, the effects of different vaccines, uh, uh, the anti-PEG antibody level um, in, um, um, in, um, in uh, people who were vaccinated with, uh, with the different vaccines shown here, the Pfizer, Moderna. And again, we, we see that the Moderna <coughs> is associated with very, very high uh, anti-PEG antibodies. <coughs> uh, the, this uh, figure illustrates the effect of the vaccine on the anti-PEG uh, anti antibody level. Uh, you can see the first Pfizer, second Pfizer, third Pfizer uh, uh, injection, then the first mon uh, um, um, Moderna, second Moderna, et cetera. We even uh, looked at Sinopharm um, and, and other vaccines, AstraZeneca. They, they all um, were uh, more or less, um, so in, at least in some people, um, they, uh, they entailed uh, elevated PEG. And I have to say that um, although uh, <clears throat> these, the, uh, the Sinopharm, uh, the uh, AstraZeneca uh, do not contain a PEG, but they contain uh, polysorbate. Uh, and we know that polysorbate and PEG antibodies can cross-react. So <clears throat> the fact that um, these antibodies uh, are in, induced by these vaccines, at least in some people, uh, is not uh, without any explanation. And here is the, uh, the most critical uh, figure where we compared on an individual basis the effect of, of the vaccines on anti-PEG. And <clears throat> we can see that uh, on a, this is a log scale. And uh, these are uh, anti-PEG antibody levels compared to the pre-vaccination con uh, control level. Uh, implying that uh, to what degree the antibody um, uh, increased after vaccination, um, uh, that's a period over many months after several vaccination. And we have chosen the, the top level, the highest level, because it undulated and some, in some cases decreased. But we always <coughs> can identify a maximum value. And if it is uh, compared uh, to the baseline, then we see <coughs> um, like eight, an average of eightfold <coughs> uh, increase uh, after the Pfizer vaccine, um, uh, with some people um, increasing eighty to a hundredfold, uh, and the uh, the same applies to the um, uh, anti-PEG IgG, uh, although the increase here is um, less expressed. Now, <coughs> uh, correlating. Uh, uh, reactions uh, with anti-PEG antibody levels in, in the blood of people. Uh, we found, uh, we included in our uh, study um, uh, 13 uh, uh, subjects who displayed very strong reaction. Uh, some of them had to be hospitalized for weeks. Uh, <clears throat> all of them had to be treated uh, with uh, emergency measures. Uh, they belong to category three in our uh, estimation or evaluation. But there were other um, re reactions uh, <clears throat> which were less severe, but still um, we can see that the anti-PEG uh, IgG and anti-PEG IgM in their level uh, are significantly uh, higher than the people who did not show any reaction. So this is a, a, a key evidence for a role of anti-PEG antibodies uh, in our uh, studies. <clears throat> Uh, causing complement activation to lead to these conclusions as follows. The, <coughs> the allergy <coughs> uh, uh, anaphylaxis problem with the mRNA uh, LMP vaccines may partly be caused by anti-PEG antibodies via complement activation, but complement activation may play a contributing or permissive role. It may be <coughs> sole driver 
uh, only uh, in extreme activation, there are people, uh, uh, there are animals in which complement activation can be extremely exaggerated. And then uh, it is clear that the reaction um, can be explained solely by uh, C5A, C3A. Now, <clears throat> in pigs, particularly in those um, with high anti-pig antibody levels, um, uh, we can use this model um, to modeling and thus helping to solve this problem. Uh, mRNA LMP vaccines can be immunogenic uh, in a fraction of humans, which is extremely important because uh, we get repeatedly vaccinated. And uh, there is a concern that people uh, are vaccinated not against, not only against the, um, the virus, but also against PEG. And we are surrounded by PEG uh, day and night. Uh, every, in food, in hygienic uh, items, um, everywhere. And <clears throat> if this is true, um, then we can expect um, increased numbers of uh, allergies uh, against PEG, or pseudo-allergy, that is to say, people do not know about it, but find it out uh, later, uh, the <clears throat> skin test will not become positive. So the high anti-PEG antibody level uh, in humans represent a risk factor for anaphylaxis. It is not um, a defining factor. It is just a risk factor. And not everybody reacts who has very high anti-PEG antibody levels. And not all reactions can be explained by anti-PEG antibody, but there is definitely a correlation between the two. And therefore the measurement of anti-PEG antibodies in blood may serve as a safety assay a biomarker biomarker to predict who would uh, or who would not react. And before um, closing, uh, let me address uh, a few trivial arguments that has been raised uh, in the literature against the CARPA concept and the pig model, <clears throat> which uh, have been repeated. So I consider them uh, only as myth. This uh, term was suggested by, <clears throat> uh, by the title of uh, our last presenter or the uh, Professor Mogimi. So what is the myth? Uh, and one of the um, argument against this um, concept and the whole is that the pig uh, is an uh, over sensitive uh, misleading model. It is, uh, it, it is, uh, its expression is exaggerated. So <clears throat> the answer to that, that the pig is a disease model and not a, um, a standard uh, toxicity model. Then there is um, another argument about the uh, in involvement of complement is that uh, if complement would be um, a driver or an important in these reactions, then everybody would react. And it has to, has to be reminded that complement activation has many rate limiting uh, <clears throat> effects, uh, which are uh, closer to the efficacy to the, to the changes and which can be rate limiting. Complement activation is not, um, it does not equal with reaction or anaphylaxis. And the anti pegalizas we have heard uh, some doubts about it, uh, even the existence of anti peg antibodies, and we are very uh, curious to learn about this later, about uh, problems about non-specific binding um, interfering due to the unnatural epitope exposure. Uh, the antibodies are uh, plated um, in an unnatural form compared to their position uh, or their uh, natural existence in blood. And <clears throat> obviously, um, the lack of a defined standard, it's not possible to have one anti peg antibody used as a standard. Um, and this is a problem. But uh, these problems have been addressed and solved for many who are working in this field. There are hundreds of people are now working, reporting complement uh, anti peg data. So I, I would not be so much concerned about uh, the existence of these antibodies and leading to the last slide in which I acknowledge my uh, colleagues <clears throat> uh, on the left and our funding. Um, uh, we are working together with all these companies here um, in, a, uh, in some uh, European grants, Horizon um, Expert Biosafety Grant and some Hungarian grants. And thank you very much for your attention. With this, I would uh, stop here. Uh, thank you very much, Janusz. So we are almost 15 minutes behind the schedule. We received two questions from the audience and I pasted them in the chat box. Um, uh, so just for the sake of time, uh, what I suggest, 
uh, could you please uh, answer these uh, questions to everyone in the chat? And uh, I invite uh, participants from audience to join debate room at the end of this session for more in-depth discussion. Because we, ha we have to move on. OK, um, then I stop. And um, let me see. From the doxid is infused versus community is in I am. I lost. Okay, can you read it? I, I lost it. Um, uh, it's in the chat box. Okay. So one question was, uh, Doxil is infused and uh, the vaccine is ad administered IM. Is the route of administration, what, what's, what is the role of the route of administration? Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, we, we know very well uh, that um, uh, the, uh, it is different, uh, but there are ways uh, ex uh, which explain how the vaccine could get into blood. And one is um, a, a lecture just be heard by uh, Professor Mogimi, who uh, explained that the PEG directs the um, uh, nanoparticles to the lymph system. And uh, although the lymph systems are screened by the lymph nodes, but some nanoparticles do get in blood. Um, and also, when uh, uh, accidentally um, the injection hits the, the, a blood vessel in the muscle that gets into the blood. And also there are inflammations uh, at the site of injection. And with inflammation, the uh, uh, capillary permeability increases and these nanoparticles can exit to the, to the blood there. So <clears throat> the relevance of the model uh, is that uh, it applies to those people uh, in whom the vaccine gets into the blood by, by some way, uh, which could be different for everybody. Janusz, thank you so much. And sorry for interrupting you. We, we have to move on. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, let us yeah. uh, leave the other questions for the debate room. OK, OK. And that, that gives, uh, gives me the room to introduce you, Marina. Um, you are Marina Dobrovolskaya, um, uh, uh, director of um, operations. Uh, she is the head of. Uh, of uh, immunology uh, department at the NCL uh, Nanoparticle Characterization Laboratory in, in Frederick, Maryland, which is part of the National Cancer Institute. Um, Marina, um, the podium is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, so I will try to catch up, uh, put us on schedule. So this is an uh, uh, outline of uh, my presentation. Uh, I will go over uh, very briefly introducing my lab, talk about trends in nanoparticles, immunological reactions, and uh, present case studies to demonstrate that each component of the formulation, including uh, carrier, therapeutic nucleic acid, and formulation components contribute to overall immunological response to the formulation. So very briefly, Briefly, for those of you who don't know about us, NCL uh, is a national and international resource for nanotechnology product developers. We've been in operations for over 17 years, and we support extramural research community by characterizing nano formulations in our assay cascade, which includes physical chemical characterization and in vitro and in vivo immunology, pharmacology, toxicology, as well as uh, we assist uh, uh, to nanotechnology de developers with formulation. So to learn more about our work, yeah, please visit our website. So in the last 17 years, we characterized over 450 unique nanoparticles uh, and over 1,000 of nanoparticle formulations in total. And uh, on this graph, you see the uh, breakdown by the type of material. So the majority of materials that come to NCL are polymer-based, lipid-based, and metallic nanoparticles, but we also worked with other types of formulations. So I will name you two main trends that we observed uh, after this uh, 17 years, and then I will focus on one of them to go in a more in-depth uh, discussion. So first of all, I would like to talk about plasma coagulation. So what is interesting is in the last uh, 17 years, we look at the proportion of the formulation that uh, um, result in prolongation of the plasma coagulation time, we see an increase. And then we look at the chemical composition of this material. We see that uh, majority of these materials are polymer-based, about a third is lipid-based. And then we have materials that contain both lipids and polymers uh, as part of nanocarrier and 
as components of the formulations uh, as excipients or both. And here you just see the example, a case study of the final product demonstrating concentration dependent prolongation of plasma coagulation time and the same effects at the equivalent concentrations were reproduced with the uh, polymer used uh, in the uh, carrier to confirm that it was a polymer driven effect. So uh, then we look in the uh, another trend that we see, that trend is in cytokines. And the reason I like to talk about cytokines because cytokines are excellent markers of immunostimulation. Immunostimulation is not a guarantee for immunogenicity, yet it is an important prerequisite of immunogenicity and uh, it is uh, uh, a good uh, indicator of overall inflammatory properties. And uh, we observed formulations that include broad spectrum of cytokines. A uh, proportion of these formulations are highlighted here in blue. But as you see, the majority of formulations that we are seeing are those that induce chemokines only. And chemokines are a subset of cytokines, uh, uh, which role is to attract immune cells to the site of inflammation. Now, if we look at the chemical composition of these materials, we see that majority of these materials that induce chemokines only are lipid-based, about a third are uh, polymer-based, and then uh, the rest uh, contain either lipids or polymers uh, also as uh, uh, components of the carrier or excipients or uh, both. So uh, in the next few slides, what I would like to do, I would like to focus on cytokines and review some case studies. So first in the structure activity relationship study that we conducted in our lab with different formulations, at that time, we only focused uh, on uh, chemokine interleukin-8. We observed that uh, materials inducing high levels of interleukin-8 are those that induce also oxidative stress and that the chemokine response to uh, these liposomes um, could be suppressed with n cysteine Now, I want to say that among these liposomes, there were cationic liposomes, anionic liposomes, and neutral liposomes, and those that induce oxidative stress and high levels of chemokines are pegylated liposomes. Now we take the, with different uh, density of the pack on the surface. And if we take the same uh, molecular weight pack uh, at the equivalent density and put it on the surface of uh, gold nanoparticles, we do not observe this effect. So definitely lipid components contribute uh, to this. Uh, with, in collaboration with uh, Professor Barinholtz from Hebrew University, we wanted to know what can we do uh, with this first generation pegylated liposomes to manage uh, the induction of the chemokines by these carriers. And so with Hezi's help, uh, we found that the iron content in the liposomal cavity contribute to the uh, inflammatory response and that uh, ammonium sulfate uh, uh, field liposomes are more pro-inflammatory than their calcium acetate counterparts. Uh, cationic liposomes are used uh, frequently for nucleic acid delivery, uh, and uh, some of them are used in vaccines. And these uh, liposomes are more pro-inflammatory. Here, as you see on the spectrum uh, of the cytokines, uh, so we see not only chemokines, and by the way, we see broader spectrum of chemokine, but we also see pro-inflammatory cytokines and uh, danger signals uh, such as IL-1 alpha and metalloproteinases. Interestingly, uh, oxidative stress is, in, uh, is also the mechanism underlying inflammatory response to cationic liposomes as well. Uh, it is important to recognize that biomarkers of immunostimulation depend on the type of nanomaterial. So here I talked about liposomes, uh, especially because uh, organizers of this conference asked me to talk about lipid-based particles. Um, and um, uh, you know, different carriers uh, have their signature, you know, cytokines, uh, but also the active pharmaceutical ingredient uh, for the focus of this presentation, I will use therapeutic nucleic acids. They all have different signature cytokines. For the therapeutic nucleic acids, the biomarkers of immunostimulation are type 1 interferons. And I'm not going to talk about the siRNA or antisense oligonucleotides, the traditional nucleic acids. I would like for this presentation to focus on nucleic acid nanoparticles 
nanoparticles. So these are nanoparticles with different shapes and sizes that are made of DNA and RNA and used in vaccine as adjuvants. And also some researchers are trying to use them to deliver uh, other therapeutic nucleic acids such as siRNA. And so in collaboration that we conducted with Dr. Uh, Afonin from uh, UNC and Charlotte, we uh, found some structure activity relationship and that uh, composition, architecture, and size of this nucleic acid nanoparticles contribute to their ability to induce type 1 interferon in that uh, RNA-based materials are more potent and three-dimensional structures, the cubicle structures are more potent than planar structures and fibro structures. And there is some uh, size contribution uh, at the level of the hexagons, and we see the increase in uh, the uh, interferon response. But very interestingly, and I would like to emphasize it, unlike traditional nucleic acids such as CPG uh, oligonucleotides or uh, siRNA, the uh, interferon response or inflammatory response to nucleic acid nanoparticles uh, does not exist unless we deliver these particles inside the cell with another carrier. So if you think of this nucleic acid nanoparticle, it's a particle that requires another particle for delivery uh, into the cell. Uh, and <clears throat> Another of, uh, amazing property of these materials that the spectrum uh, and the magnitude of the cytokine response to these materials could be directed by uh, manipulating the carrier used to deliver them to immune cells. So here we uh, observe uh, interferon response to DNA, RNA nanoparticles delivered using lipid carrier. But if we change carrier to polymer, like dendrimer in this case, we completely lose interferon response. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we do not see danger signals like IL-1, TNF, uh, if we uh, deliver uh, nucleic acid nanoparticles using lipid carrier, but uh, we see dramatic inflammatory response uh, in the form of this uh, danger uh, signals and inflammatory cytokines, then we deliver the same particle using the polymeric carrier. So uh, each component of the formulation can contribute to the response to the final product. And if we take the therapeutic nucleic acid that induces interferon response and combine it with a carrier that induces chemokines, we expect to see a final product uh, possessing both uh, properties. Uh, here I show you a case study from our assay cascade characterization. We have a nanoparticle platform not inducing interferon, but inducing chemokine response. Uh, this platform delivers antisense oligonucleotide, which induces interferon response, uh, uh, but does not induce uh, chemokine response. But the final product inherited uh, both uh, interferon and chemokine response. And then we talk about formulations. We uh, do not, uh, uh, we uh, cannot uh, forget about excipients because uh, excipients are also not immunologically inured, even if they are generally regarded as uh, safe. So this is uh, an excerpt from the study which we conducted in collaboration with FDA, where we looked at the peptide uh, drug product, and we observed that uh, the signature cytokine for this product is prostaglandin. Uh, PG2. Uh, so uh, we observe PG2 induction by the product, the same induction uh, we observe with formulation buffer, and then we test individual components of the formulation buffer. We see that each of them contribute to this cytokine response we observe uh, in the final product. So to conclude, uh, nanocarriers and APIs of certain types display common trends. And in my presentation, I mentioned uh, effects on coagulation and cytokine induction. Each product is unique and has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. But we also uh, see that each product has its own signature. And that signature includes uh, coagulation profile, cytokine profile, effects on the platelets, and other uh, various components uh, of uh, immune uh, system. All components of nanoformulations, including carrier, API, and excipients, contribute to the overall response. So with this, I would like to thank my colleagues at the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab, and uh, thank you all uh, for your uh, attention. So uh, I know that I used uh, less time uh, than allocated for my talk, but because uh, we need to get back on schedule, I would like to proceed. I would like to invite everyone to join debate room for uh, questions, but um, 
And now I would like to proceed introducing next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Laszlo Desi. Uh, he is with Semmelweis University Institute of Translational Medicine. And uh, he will talk to us about uh, his experience with a uh, porcelain model of allergic reactions. So uh, Laszlo, please, the microphone is yours. And I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Marina. And thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. And thank you for the invitation uh, to Klinam. And uh, I hope you can see my presentation. Yes? Is it OK? Yep. OK. So. Uh, Believe it or not, <laughs> I was uh, using this picture uh, as an um, art picture uh, in my nano, uh, medicines lectures to the students uh, until the uh, outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, thanks to the uh, quick de development of vaccines, it uh, could be uh, effectively uh, fought uh, against this pandemic. But uh, uh, as, as we know, uh, these new uh, LMP mRNA uh, vaccines uh, uh, played a very important uh, uh, role in this uh, fight against the vaccination. But unfortunately, uh, as for all vaccines, there are side effects. And if you look at this uh, WHO uh, uh, report, you can see that uh, the most uh, uh, common uh, side effects of the uh, vaccines, but it is emphasized that mostly they are mild uh, or moderate and short lasting. And uh, turn to the uh, community vaccine, which were uh, in our, which was in our focus. Uh, there is another report from the European Medicines uh, Agency that. Uh, uh, for community vaccines in uh, human vaccination, allergic reactions, hypersensitivity have been uh, seen uh, in people uh, receiving in, uh, this vaccine, although in a very small number of cases, but uh, sometimes anaphylaxis uh, uh, occurred and uh, it, uh, it, for some people it prevented uh, 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 the use of uh, this uh, vaccine. But uh, coming back in, in time a little bit, uh, uh, knowing that this was a, a, a lipid nanoparticle based uh, vaccine, this is no wonder because we have seen in the previous years uh, for many nanoparticles, a pseudo allergic reaction in men, for example, for uh, among liposomal drugs, doxyl and ambisome or uh, Taxol in micelle solubilis uh, uh, drugs, or even uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, like rituximab. And even worse, but these are nanomedicines that for, for the, the, um, uh, the contrast agents and other enzymes uh, could also show this, this property. So uh, of course, uh, it was in the focus of the regulatory authorities. So the regulatory response from e, uh, EMA was, a reflection paper, and uh, in this reflection paper, they they uh, said that the developers uh, should test uh, against this uh, immunotoxicity reaction, and they named uh, specifically that uh, the use of in vitro and in vivo in immune reactogenicity uh, assays, such as complement and or macrophage basophil activation assays and testing for complement activation related pseudoallergic CARPA uh, in sensitive models is needed. The question is, uh, what, uh, these, uh, what are these models? But first of all, for those who are not, familiar, not so familiar with CARPA, CARPA is an acronym uh, meaning complement activation related pseudoallergy or uh, infusion reaction because it's experienced mostly uh, upon the infusion uh, of uh, anti-cancer drugs or other type of drugs or anaphylactic reaction is called. And we, uh, we know some properties that, for example, it's, this is not IgE mediated, but the incidence, uh, unfortunately, is relatively high. It could uh, be up to 2 to 40%. And also, 
uh, in some percentage, it would be let up. And uh, uh, if we compare the uh, human and animal uh, data, because of course, upon this, uh, this uh, um, uh, suggestion from the authorities, not only EMA, uh, EMA but also FDA uh, suggested such tests, uh, there uh, were studies to, uh, to compare human and animal reactions and only the uh, major symptoms I uh, uh, list here, hemodynamic, cardiopulmonary skin reactions and uh, change in the, in, in the blood uh, uh, cells. And also, if you look at these models and you compare, for example, pig, rat, dog models to the reactive men, then you see that uh, pigs are very uh, sensitive, so it represents a, a natural hypersensitive model, so therefore it could be a very good prediction model uh, for, uh, for the uh, human uh, uh, reaction for nanoparticles. So in our uh, porcine carpa model, we measure uh, various parameters. First of all, these peaks are uh, uh, about uh, eight to 10 uh, weeks old and about 20, 25 uh, uh, kilogram uh, body weight they have. They are anesthetized, but freely ventilated at what we measure. The most important in our case is uh, to study the cardiovascular um, and cardiopulmonary reactions. We insert the Schwann-Ganz catheter via the venous uh, system, via the right heart to the pulmonary artery. And the most important in this case is the, the changes in pulmonary arterial uh, pressure. But also we observe the respiratory changes like uh, the entire, uh, entitled uh, CO2. Uh, and uh, we do uh, regularly, we take blood samples and analyze the blood cell uh, uh, count Thromb uh, thrombocytes and uh, white uh, blood cells are the most important. And also from the uh, samples, we measure the thromboxane formation. And we measure T uh, T TXB2, the, uh, the stable analog of uh, TXA2. And of course, as a uh, complement as Janos uh, uh, mentioned before. And uh, here, here is a, an experiment, some reactions. So what we see here, is the pulmonary uh, artery pressure elevation upon injection of a, a liposome. And I didn't mention uh, before maybe that in, in a very, very low concentration, we use this liposome. And so here is the, the reaction, but also we, de we see different uh, systemic blood pressure changes uh, in most cases decrease, but sometimes uh, there are other reactions. And we also measure e ECG uh, changes heart rate and so on. And in addition to these cardiovascular parameters, you, you see here again this response, this transient uh, uh, pulmonary artery pressure elevation, and also it correlates very well uh, with changes uh, in thromboxane. Uh, and also here are the changes in the, in the uh, blood cells. All, uh, there could be a decrease or increase in platelets and also in, in white blood cells. Uh, lymphocytes and granulocytes. And here are the skin reactions Janos also mentioned before, a flush reaction or rush could be seen. And uh, zymosan is very important in our uh, experiments because this is our reference compound, this glucan. And we, we heard uh, before in, uh, in, um, uh, in lectures, the role of, uh, uh, of glucans uh, uh, in uh, uh, such reactions. And the zymosan uh, not only directly acts on complement, but also uh, via uh, toll-like uh, receptors, it activates the, uh, NF, uh, the NF-kappa B uh, signaling uh, pathway. And the versatility of uh, our porcine model, I, um, I want to show uh, very briefly. So it could be uh, used the classical CARPA uh, uh, symptoms, uh, as I explained before, the immunological markers, just like anaphylatoxins, vasoactive mediators, cytokines, but uh, uh, also, like I said, pigs resemble the hypersensitive humans, so therefore lack of a porcine carpa predicts hum human safety, but of course translational studies are needed to confirm this, but sever carpa reactivity warrants further development of the tested nanoparticles, of course. Anaphylaxis, uh, uh, rarely, but it occurs sometimes, and this pre predicts undesirable adverse effects in humans, and it uh, also warrants further developments. 
Pachyphylaxis, the self-induced tolerance, is a chance to mitigate ad adverse reactions. Uh, there are protocols, for example, infusion instead of uh, injection or using a small dose, dose and then uh, it uh, induces uh, pachyphylaxis and then high dose will not be so dangerous. Or testing different, uh, we, we could test in this model different types of nanoparticles like liposomes, spions, lipidots, fucoidin, and so on. And also, uh, we could uh, say um, some hints on the effect of design, sign coating, surface charge, and so on. And uh, we also used the ex extension of CARPA model in combination with other methods, for example, hemodialysis uh, hemodyl device. We coupled together uh, with the CARPA reaction to see interesting results. And finally, testing particles via uh, non IV applications. Uh, could be uh, also very useful. There was a question on it and, and Janos partly answered uh, the, the significance of this. And i just quickly show some previous data. For example, uh, li uh, in liposomal uh, nanodrugs, ambisome, when you repeat it, then you see the same uh, reaction. And after all, uh, you see the same reaction for doxyl or similar reaction and also zymosan. So there is no uh, for example, cross tolerance or uh, something like this. But for example, for, oops, sorry, uh, to for doxyl, if you uh, apply it in a very low dose, 0.01 uh, milligram phospholipid milligram per kilogram, and you repeat, uh, and using even a higher dose, you see this uh, tachyphylaxis, and still zymosan response remains the the, the same. And uh, I'll show you some uh, some of our data on spions. For example, you know very well that Resovist, uh, uh, a uh, dextran-coated uh, 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 drug, had to be withdrawn from the market, uh, mainly uh, because of this, this uh, hypersensitivity reaction. But uh, in our previous uh, studies in the uh, nanomedicine, uh, nano uh, atero uh, project, we saw uh, we worked together uh, uh, with uh, some some colleagues uh, uh, from Erlangen, and they develop uh, dextran coated uh, nanoparticles in different sizes, and they could size down from 80 to 50 and 30 nanometers without uh, any pulmonary artery pressure change, and also it was confirmed by by the thromboxane reaction, and uh, I mean no thromboxane. Uh, or big thromboxane elevation, but uh, zymosan showed the same reaction. And also, we, uh, we, we used small lipid uh, particles, lipid dots, without any uh, adverse uh, uh, side effects. But uh, we were, sorry, we were using infusion to avoid because uh, upon an injection there were some effects, but we could mit mitigate it using infusion. And also, what I mentioned, uh, we used CARPA and hemodialysis together, and we could uh, show the, the dialysis reaction and some, some hints uh, about the possible cause of uh, this reaction. So then came the idea, let's test communat in the porcine carpa model, although this is a different uh, way of a route of application and, and uh, also a little bit different, but still we uh, uh, give a chance to try it. And we got this paper Janos mentioned before, and just very briefly, I just put, uh, I, I, I just take some of the data. So uh, we were using 14 uh, peaks uh, in this uh, in this study, and we made much more, but uh, in this study only uh, this was involved, and we used uh, community in a human dose, increasing uh, human doses. So we used it in a one two and five fold uh, human uh, dose intravenously, of course, because we wanted to, co uh, to compare uh, the response to an, uh, our nanoparticle uh, responses. And for the one, for those in this case, these are just individual cases, not statistics. Uh, but we uh, saw that uh, a small reaction occurred and there was no tachyphylaxis upon the uh, repetition of this reaction, uh, it was the same. On the other hand, zymosan gave us a very harsh reaction. In fact, the uh, anaphylaxis sorry, occurred, so the animal uh, 
should, should be survived with cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And upon the twofold dose, we already saw uh, uh, relatively high uh, CARPA response at PAT elevation, but on the second uh, 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 injection, we saw a, a tachyphylaxis, but still, nevertheless, we saw a very uh, uh, severe reaction to, um, to uh, zymosan, and fivefold dose also gave a similar response. And here is a, a table which shows that we had uh, these 14 animals, and I, ca I cannot go uh, uh, to details because of the lack of uh, time, but we also used some, some, uh, some uh, uh, immunizations uh, and also worked on naive animals. Uh, what I wanted, want to show that uh, we saw anaphylaxis uh, in one case, not for the zymosan, but for the, for the uh, community vaccine. And also, what you, we, you can see in this table that we also uh, saw the blood cell uh, changes I emphasized uh, uh, before. So here is this uh, experiment, the, this case where that the a fivefold do, uh, dose of uh, community uh, gave a very severe reaction. Here is the increase in the pulmonary arterial pressure, but most importantly, uh, the animal uh, went to an anaphylactic shock. So we needed to uh, resuscitate uh, to get back into, into life. But upon the re uh, repetition, there we saw a tachyphylaxis. And here are the uh, uh, EEG ab ab abnormalities and also the flush of what we saw upon uh, this uh, injection. And also the thromboxane, uh, I, I show you for, for, uh, for different uh, doses, the one-fold and two-fold dose. Here first, uh, we didn't see a reaction, but the twofold dose gave us a thromboxane increase, and also a fivefold dose uh, gave us a nice reaction. But upon uh, repeating it, it diminished. And the green is zymosan, and also we saw similar reaction in in uh, panel uh, C. So to summarize my talk. Uh, LMP mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are e effective, but in rare cases, uh, they induce uh, pseudoallergic reactions. Regulatory agencies require testing of intravenous lip liposomal uh, products in sensitive animal models. Porcine uh, CARPA model is a naturally hypersensitive model used to test various types of nanoparticles, including liposomes, spions, and lipidots, and so on. Beyond it, its original goal, using an external uh, CARPA model, the background of hypersensitivity reactions during hemodialysis was also explored. Based on their similar symptoms of human infusions uh, of nanomedicines and vaccinations, by chance, the potential CARPA origin of short-term adverse effects of vaccine has been tested. And we were able to demonstrate in a pig model that the injection of community vaccine causes similar hemodynamic and other changes to the infusion uh, reactions of nanomedicines. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laszlo. Uh, if Marina um, is not connecting, I am um, just uh, in lack of time. I I, uh, I don't see any question uh, in the chat room, so um, all questions are expected in the chat room later. And uh, <clears throat> then I take the chance to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, <clears throat> uh, Doctor. Carrie Christine Nadeau, if, I don't know. Nadeau uh, sounds French for me, so I don't know if uh -huh. I pronounce it correctly, but uh, uh, Carrie Christine is certain. And she is a professor uh, at um, <clears throat> um, Stanford University, um, uh, the professor of medicine in pediatrics, um, and uh, <clears throat> she is a director of the uh, Center for Allergy and Asthma research. Um, Carrie, the word is yours. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and I hope all is well. I'm following 
some wonderful investigators in this field already. And I wanna thank Janos, and Marina and Laszlo for their excellent presentations. I also want to be cautious in that any mechanism that we talk about today obviously isn't the only mechanism by which we could see reactions to these particular vaccines. They are rare, they need to be managed. And in my mind, this vaccine is so important for public health that the scientists here today, looking at the knowledge of mechanisms, are all here to help so that we have less fear about what's happening and more understanding so that we can mitigate risks and help public health by being able to combat COVID-19 infections. So what I'll do today is talk specifically about some background, clinical study results, mechanistic studies, and conclusion for those work that has been done at Stanford University in particular. So I think all of you know that a prototypic allergic reaction, which is IgE mediated, importantly results in IgE that binds to the FC epsilon receptor that binds to effector cells like a basophil. And those reactions happen within seconds to minutes and typically result in tryptase release of these cells that are activated with a type one allergic response. Upstream from that IgE isotype switching of B cells, there are many other events that need to happen. For example, this is an allergen like food, which is a protein. And today we're not talking about proteins necessarily, we're talking about nanoparticles. But typically the sine qua non of an allergic response is a protein allergen being taken up by the immune system and presented. And then B cells over time after multiple exposures produced IgE. Importantly, is that as we understood as allergists what was going on with the vaccine reactions, it was a little more complicated than a type 1 IgE mediated reaction. And back in December 2020, we started to confirm anaphylaxis cases. This was being done through the FDA uh, because a lot of healthcare workers, especially in the US, were receiving these uh, mRNA vaccines. And most of these reactions were occurring in women and many of which were occurring in people that already had a history of allergic reactions. What that meant, we did not know. And we know that the mRNA vaccines contain a lot of different liposomal delivery products. You've heard from my colleagues today about this. And importantly, we didn't know which component of the vaccine could be inducing these types of allergic reactions. But we had a hint that perhaps it was the polyethylene glycol, thanks to wonderful research done by my colleagues here as well. And we had a thought that perhaps this was also associated with complement activation related pseudoallergy or CARPA. So with that, we tracked individuals in our healthcare system at Stanford in California. And this is a single site study, but it was important because I have a laboratory, we look at allergy, but we also needed to look at complement activations. We worked across many different laboratories in the world to be able to assess this. And I wanna thank Janos for his advice as well during these difficult stages back in December, 2020 and beyond. We wanted to understand how to characterize the immunological mechanisms under, underlying these allergic reactions, the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. So again, because we wanted to approach this scientifically, objectively as to how to manage the reaction so that more and more people could get the vaccine and were not resistant to getting the vaccine. So what we did was a case series. We looked at 22 patients with suspected allergic reactions. This is a large regional healthcare network. We classified them and researched the databases that were coming out of the electronic medical record in our medical care system. And we searched all of those people that met the definition of a reaction to the vaccine only within one month from December 18th, 2020 to January 27th, 2021, because many people were getting the vaccine during that time. These were all healthcare workers. Our main outcomes and measures, we looked at allergic reactions within the first three hours of the vaccine. You can see the symptoms there. Allergic reaction grading occurred with Brighton criteria, which is what the FDA uses for defining these reactions. We also did skin prick tests, as you've seen from my colleagues. Those are helpful in terms of assessing whether or not some of the patients have reactions to these. We did polyethylene glycol alone, polysorbate, and then the vaccine alone. We didn't have any other particles of the vaccine to use. We didn't have the mRNA itself or the lipid particle, but we did have vaccine itself. 
We tested controls, obviously histamine itself, and then filtered with saline, which is a negative control. And then we also did something called the basophil activation test, which is a very helpful test for using human whole blood to look at whether or not it activated the receptors on the cell surface of the basophil. What's interesting about the basophil is it gets activated by complement or FC epsilon receptor expression with IgE binding or immunoglobulin binding. So uh, to me, the basophil test is a very nice in vitro uh, assay to assess uh, particularly allergic reactions to uh, chemicals. We looked at IgG, IgE, IgM, and then we also looked at tryptase levels because that typically uh, is uh, secreted during a type of anaphylactic reaction. So our methods for a basophil activation test include using whole blood, looking at vaccine discarded remnant material, and we used it at a concentration when we talked to Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. This was approximately what they thought might be occurring at a local level in the blood, so we used that um, concentration. And then we looked at a marker uh, in the basophils that you can use flow cytometry on to be able to look at whether or not the basophils were activated. So our methods were collecting all the individuals that were vaccinated within the month that I spoke to you about. We looked at the coding um, for any reactions that occurred in the patients. And of those, you can see we had 46 that had reactions to the mRNA vaccine, BioNTech versus the Moderna. And then when we reviewed all the criteria, we saw that 22 actually met the criteria for allergic reactions. I don't want people to think too much into this in terms of the, um, the prevalence of allergic reactions. This is just one large site in the United States, but importantly is we're not commenting upon the epidemiology of how many reactions occur within a given population. Of the 22, 17 uh, were BioNTech and five were Moderna. Now, importantly, is the most of the healthcare workers at Stanford were given Pfizer because that's what the state of California had bought in particular in uh, preparation for vaccination. So it's this is not any uh, random choice. This is actually a choice because California bought more BioNTech and Pfizer than Moderna vaccine in that month. Of 17 patients actually had reactions that met the Brighton criteria, and of the 17, 14 had received BioNTech, and three had received Moderna. Of the 22 patients that I spoke about, 20 were women, they were approximately in middle age, and 68% uh, had clinical allergic history, and again, 77% met the Brighton allergic anaphylactic criteria. What was very interesting was that when we did skin prick tests, they were not positive to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate. And we did use the vaccine itself to do skin testing and only one was positive to the actual skin prick test of the vaccine. So this says a lot about how we need to potentially diagnose. And you've heard from my colleagues about serum levels of IgG, IgM, um, and skin prick testing does not seem to be uh, the best way to screen for this particular allergic disorder. We did basophil activation tests, and importantly, 91% were positive to polyethylene glycol with activation in vitro, and importantly, 100% were positive when we incubated the basophils of that particular person with the mRNA vaccine. We did not detect any IgE to PEG, and we also looked at PEG IgG, which I'll show you in a second. This is an example that was published in JAMA on our basophil assay. You can see here, you can look in a, a typical flow cytometry uh, graphic, and you can look at the positive control, which is here. Uh, we always do this in our assay as well as a negative control. But importantly, when you compare the positive control to just incubating this particular patient who had a reaction to the vaccine with the vaccine itself, in an ex vivo assay, you can see the contribution. Within 20 minutes, we could see the CD63 expression on the basophil, meaning that it was activated. So then we moved forward to try to understand what were the mechanisms behind this activation. And uh, we assessed the PEG IgE, which you can see for 13 non-allergic controls 
who had received the vaccine without any allergic reaction, there was no PEG IgE. And then for those that had an allergic reaction within three hours, we also did not see any PEG IgE. That doesn't mean that's not there. It just means in these individuals, we did not detect it. Then we looked at PEG IgG using standard assays. And you can see even uh, after uh, 30 days or uh, minimally 11 days for the patients that had allergies to the vaccine at blood draw number one, compared to blood draw number two, which could be up to 80 days later, you can see a decrease in the PEG IgG. Uh, but importantly, we saw this increase in the PEG IgG, very similar to what Janos had shown. But the non-allergic controls, we did not see the PEG IgG. Then we looked at IgM. Uh, and we also saw different distributions, but we also saw the IgM and the non-allergic uh, controls as well. We moved forward, and thanks to collaborators across the United States, we did residual hemolytic activity as an assay to test for complement activation. And with that, it was very interesting to see to what extent the uh, non-allergic and the allergic individuals had different RHAs. Um, there was some statistical significance here between the non-allergic and the allergic group. And uh, what we did, we also depleted IgG in these reactions. And you can see to the extent that IgG depletion uh, increased the average residual hemolytic activity, again, showing and inferring that there could perhaps be complement involved in these reactions. Then we went further and we looked at individuals that had basophil reactivity to the vaccine. As I showed you before, you can easily do this in a flow cytometry assay within 20 minutes of ex vivo incubation with a given uh, material, either vaccine or excipients or proteins. And here I want to point out that even at zero, you can see some natural activation in the allergic individuals. So these are people that had high responses to the vaccine already. And even without perturbation with the vaccine being incubated ex vivo, they are already having background activation of their basophils, which says to me that there's more of a long-term activation going on because some of these bloods were drawn even 30 to 60 days after they had had the reaction. Importantly, we saw two distributions. There were those individuals that had immediate reactions to the vaccine, and they had a, what we call a high basophil response with very high levels of CD63. They were more in this category. And then we had those individuals that had a low basophil response, more in the lower range of CD63. And there seems to be a difference in terms of their timing of their reaction. Finally, we looked at associations between PEG, anti-PEG IgG and uh, residual hemolytic activity. You can see the R squared score here and the statistical significance value. Again, these are small numbers, but the trend is there. Looking at IgM versus IgG, there was in particular more of an association with IgG. And then we also looked at the basophil response uh, with C5 and C3. And so this to me is also very interesting to try to dissect out what mechanisms might be happening. And so very preliminarily, we believe that there's probably two types of uh, responses going on. And we've only looked at one cell so far in the immune system. It would be very interesting to look at neutrophils and other cells that could be mediating this reaction more chronically. Uh, we looked at the basophil because it's an effector cell for allergy, but we think that one mechanism could include complement dependent activation of the basophil with immunoglobulin, specifically in this case, IgG to PEG. And then the low basophil response, probably as Janos also had mentioned, probably includes other uh, types of responses to other cells, and this needs to be looked at more carefully. So I'm giving you some preliminary data today. I'm excited to be able to be here and talk about this because I'm very curious as to what these mechanisms include. They'll probably be varied depending upon individuals, but it is interesting in conclusion that women uh, have uh, um, more of these reactions to mRNA. We need to understand what's happening with the mRNA vaccines. Immunological tests seem to be helpful. We need to make sure that we understand what's happening with the anti-PEG IgG antibody and IgM. And I hope to uh, continue this wonderful research with uh, many people here. Thank you. 
thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Um, we'll save questions for the debate room uh, and uh, we have to move on. Uh, it is a, a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Moin Mahimi. Uh, and um, uh, he will talk, uh, he, he has many affiliations, Moin, please forgive me, I, I, I'll skip this. So he'll talk about uh, COVID vaccines and allergic reactions. The microphone uh, is yours. Thank you, Marin. Let me, I think I have a little problem here with the, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, is it on the full mode now, right? Yep, yep. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, may I first thank uh, Bert for inviting me again. I mean, he asked me to give two talks for this cleanup, which is, you know, it's, it's a great honor to be here and also giving the two talks. So what I'm going to talk about, uh, continue on the previous speakers about these COVID vaccines and allergic reactions and, and try to, to give our perception of what is actually going on and some of the mechanisms that we be trying to look into it. Uh, let me just start by, by going through the, the, the vaccination we had and at very early time point when these vaccines came out, going back to the November, December of 2020, and the statistics were quite accurate those days, and you can see of around 2 million recipients at that time. We had about 775 cases of severe allergic reaction, and on those, 21 were anaphylaxis based on the underbrighton classification. And when you look at the details of those which was uh, provided, 17 of those uh, individuals had a medical history of allergies, and seven of whom also had history of anaphylaxis. So well, you're talking about an extremely small group of the patients, and statistically that comes to around 0.001% of the individual that received the vaccines. Now, today we have, you know, hundreds of millions have been vaccinated, and you look at the different type of statistics. Again, we are talking about more or less the same type of percentage, around 0.001%. When you compare that to other type of lipid particles or again, a similar formulation to, uh, to these vaccine in terms of the ionized lipid like on Patro, you know, when you give them intravenously, you get around 19% of adverse reactions. So there is something different with these type of formulations and they are not really, really, you know, giving, you know, this kind of, you know, massive adverse reactions that you expect. And unfortunately, we have seen a lot of hype coming from the press because when the first two cases appeared, the whole world was technically stopping according to the press. Now, when you look at the formulation of the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna, I put the two lipids that are there and we heard a lot about these anti-PEG IgG or perhaps anti-PEG IgEs. And from the work which has been done previously by many other people in terms of identifying these anti-PEG antibodies and where do they bound, you will find the literature telling you that they actually recognizing the, the PEG uh, subunit region in the region of around six to seven subunit region. And more recently, they, they, they claim that this could be even uh, smaller than that, maybe about two to three subunit region. And when you look at the other kind of formulations similar to PEG or other kind of chemicals like polysorbate 80, which is used in uh, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and also some of the pleuronics, such as uh, Proloximal 407 and other kind of sister molecules that we have been using these in early 80s and early 90s. And actually these kind of molecules uh, put the layout foundation for the development of long circulatory particles and we have been doing these multiple injections. We have never come across any antibodies against these type of molecules, which has a very similar structure and structures to polyethylene glycol. So the question is, are these anti-PEG antibodies playing a role or not? Now, the literature actually says, the original literature going back to pegylated red blood cells, they have uh, estimated a prevalence of about 25% of the population could have these antibodies. And recently we have seen even more ridiculous figures up to around 65 to 75%. But if this is true, if you take the IVIG batches, it is the intravenous uh, immunoglobulin, which is used for many types of uh, diseases and immunological procedures, 
you should be able to find a very large quantity of these type of antibodies. And when we look into that, into different batches, we can even hardly find antibodies that actually binds to PEC. Yes, they exist very, very low levels. So the prevalence is not as high as what people are suggesting. We have done, for example, around 300 individuals uh, testing and by different methodologies. And we found not more than two or 3% of the population may have antibodies that recognize polyethylene glycol, but we don't classify them as anti-PEG antibodies because we don't know in reality what they are. There could be other type of antibodies that show cross reactivity with, with polyethylene glycol, like antiphospholipid antibodies, because they recognize different head groups of the phospholipids, anti-cholesterol, anti-squalene, and again, many other kinds of antibodies that binds to different regions of peptide proteins. So the problem that we have seen is the overestimation coming mostly from the ELISA test. Because these type of tests are based on different substrates, so and it's not standardized. So the substrates could be PEG proteins, they could be PEG lipids, and some people have even used multi-arm PEGs. So what we have done, we have used a whole range of these type of substrates, but we also try to characterize what is binding to the to the to, to these plays and what are the conformation of these polyethylene glycols and their density, because this is very, very important in terms of non-specific protein absorption, and also in terms of non-specific binding of the antibodies to these type of uh, substrates, because they can actually get trapped depending on the PEG conformation, and especially the PEG stretching and the distancing from the neighboring molecules. The other problems that we have seen is the exceedingly high concentration of the secondary antibodies used in these type of assays. And usually these are animal-based antibodies. And again, they're giving some kind of peculiar reactions to the substrates. And again, we're trying to standardize those. And, and by not using plates and instead using cell-based assays or even a nanoparticle-based assay, you do see a complete different title of these antibodies compared to this place. You can adjust the place by controlling the PEG conformation and stretching. And then if you do that, then you will see that these type of antibodies, which mostly we believe are non-specific antibodies, are actually getting a kind of a low titers. And again, we are trying to purify these antibodies and, and see the cross-reactivity of these antibodies with other substrates such as, the, such as the phospholipids and cholesterol and so on. And the other thing is when you have a competitive ELISA assay, one thing that a lot of people forget, PEG is, 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 is a water-loving molecule. It takes a lot of water. And when you add a lot of these substrates, you're actually inducing protein dehydration. And that protein dehydration also plays a very important role in terms of the protein trapping into the PEG chains. For example, we have shown a, 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 an early study with, 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 with uh, some peg related formulation. These, these are kind of a regulatory formulation like Onivide, which has a very low amount of PEG, that you do get non-specific uh, antibody binding. These antibodies bind to the proteins which are trapped in, in the PEG chains or in the surface of the liposome or the nanoparticles, and they trigger complement to some extent. But we have never seen these antibodies actually binding to the polyethylene glycol itself. And when you do PEG stretching, for example, by using a PEG pairing, you can substantially reduce this protein trapping or protein approach to the surface. Again, shows a reduction in the complement activation. And we don't have this situation with, uh, with, the, with this COVID vaccine, because if you do that, then these, these kind of uh, lipid nanoparticles are not taken up by the by muscle cells or by the immune cells, and they drain really fast into systemic circulation. So, but if you actually translate that in terms of designing of the ELISA plate, you will see a massive difference. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the, 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 the ELISA data because of a proprietary information and some patent filing, which is going at the moment. So if, I mean, I am not denying that anti-PEG antibodies do not exist. I don't call them anti-PEG antibodies. I just call them some antibodies that could recognize some PEG structures. And again, we have talked to, to many uh, hospitals and many, I mean, even local hospitals. And what is interesting is, and again, we also heard from the previous speakers that 
these type of reactions also go in patients with absolutely no history of PEG sensitivity. And when you come back to kind of a PEG latest formulation, which was given intravenously like this PEG nevacuin, which is a, a PEG elated uh, aptomer against factor 9A, you can see what a huge amount of PEG was injected to, to people in comparison to what these uh, COVID vaccines are delivering, which is technically negligible. And again, with this type of formulation, not all individuals with even high level of the so-called anti-PEG antibodies or anti-PEG IgG experience allergic reactions, and only you know, a few people actually showing this. So that actually suggests there are some differences in susceptibility to this type of antibody triggered reactions. For example, we know from the MIRIN studies that the FC gamma receptor 3 plays a very important role in the clearance of uh, antibody and antigen uh, complexes. And this is a signaling receptor that could actually trigger a whole range of pro-inflammatory reactions and in concert with the platelet activating factor. But also you have to remember that the FC gamma receptors, such as FC gamma receptor two, is also involved in desensitization. So having a lot of people being exposed to many PEG products, cosmetically or whatever, you expect that the majority of these people to be desensitized again against, against polyethylene glycol. So we have been looking on this mechanism and we're trying to see whether this type of mechanism operate in humans, because you do have the FC gamma receptor to expression on human uh, macrophages, monocytes, and so on. And again, if these antibodies actually exist, we also have to be very careful because it could be in terms of inter-individual differences in the property of these antibodies. And the majority of these antibodies, again, may not actually recognize polyethylene glycol. Coming to the IgE, again, there are a lot of doubts that there are anti uh, antibodies against the, the IgE. But the one thing which has not been considered that we are also looking at is whether the local injection of these type of vaccines could attract non-specific proteins, or there may be some of the epitopes, such as some of the ionizable lipids, which are even exposed on the surface, could actually induce cross-linking of the IgE on, 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 on mast cells or other kinds of cells immune cells locally. So that could be another important mechanism which has been totally ignored by a lot of people. So that non-specific protein absorption could be the actual key. And we are now looking in terms of proteomics, what is going on on the surface of these nanoparticles. We have also heard the role of the complement. Is there a role for complement? The answer is most likely no from our own experience because if you remember uh, from the previous lecture I, I, I gave a couple of days ago, that these, these kind of uh, vaccines, they have a very low content of PEG, so the conformation is a kind of a mushroom conformation, and the majority of these uh, vaccine uh, particles are taken up by the local muscle cells and to some extent by the immune cells, and they moderately drain into the lymphatic system. And when you look at exactly what happens in the lymphatic system from a model that we described many years ago, which has more or less the same properties of this vaccine, we can see even after two to six hours, you have a very low amount in the blood and very low amount in the RES. So all the, the rate of the drainage is moderate within the first few hours. When you try to translate that to LNPs that is injected uh, intramuscularly, at maximum, we expecting to around five to 10% reach into the systemic circulation within the two hours. But when you titrate the level of that, remember you injecting, for example, 0.3 mil of the, of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So if you go and take in that amount, largely, technically about less than 30 microliter, and you do a complement test in that range, you see very low levels of C3A and C5A in human serum with that level of the BioNTech or Moderna vaccine. And those levels are even below the level that has been administered many years ago to actually induce a kind of an immediate wheel and flare reactions, but they don't actually induce anaphylaxis. So again, I am there, I am doubtful that they actually could uh, induce complement locally or not, but again, the, the, the possibility is there. 
But you also have to be very careful in terms of the complement activation when you're using different species. And we have actually mentioned that. And again, we show that uh, there are massive differences in the mechanism and, and, and the pathways. And again, coming back to the pig in the last couple of slides, what I want to show is that there is a difference between the pig and the human, and they have pulmonary intravascular macrophages, which doesn't happen in humans. And we know from many, many years ago that whatever you inject into the pig within a minute or two is taken up by these macrophages. They respond and they secrete a whole range of pro-inflammatory mediators. And the timeline is very similar to what you see in terms of the peak period of vasoconstriction, bronchoconstriction, and pulmonary hypertension. We have shown that by destroying these macrophages using clotronate liposomes, and when you do that, you can see that pulmonary arterial pressure actually drops. And it doesn't matter what you inject afterwards, whether it's small spheres, large spheres of different surface chemistry, or pegylated lipids, or even zymosin, you don't see any thromboxane secretion or very, very low level. we showing that these macrophages are actually playing a very important role in terms of the clearance and the signaling of the receptor that recognizes these different type of particles. When you take the spheres and you attach them to the erythrocytes, and what actually happens that there is a difference between the humans and the pig. You know, it, the majority of the human erythrocytes can actually uh, you can you can absorb these, these these particles to the surface. In the pig, they are less effective. But again, if you do that and get the proportion rise, you can see about thirty percent of the particles remains free, and all the complement is always activated regardless of what formulation you use. When you inject that system into the pig itself, you can see the reactions are much, much smaller. And the area under the curve is proportional to the amount of the free spheres remaining. So technically, what is important in here is the rate of presentation of these particles to the macrophages. And now we are trying to identify these receptors which participate in signaling. And what evidence we have today is, is basically based on FC gamma receptor, which I will uh, we'll show that those data is soon in terms of the publication. But we have done recent experiments by isolating these pulmonary and intravascular macrophages from the pig. We have fully characterized them, trying to summarize the whole range of large data in one single slide for you. And uh, what we have done, we have incubated these uh, macrophages from the serum of the same animal. And we also have a heat inactivated serum to destroy a complement. And then we are challenging them with different type of particles, including zymosin. And we're measuring not only the uptake, but also secretion of a whole range of pro-inflammatory mediators, such as thromboxane B2. And you can see whether you have complement functional functionality or lack of complement functionality, there is some changes in the uptake, but thromboxane is always secreted. And whether you have a pegylated system, and even with the zymosin, you can see even there is no significant uh, statistically different. The other thing we did recently, we have designed a particle called hexasome from this type of combination of two, two molecules. And we have demonstrated that these type of hexasome do not activate complement at all in human and pig blood and pig serum and pig plasma and human. But when you inject them into the pig, you gain, you get exactly the same uh, responses such as a drop in systemic pressure and rises on pulmonary pressure. And at the same level, you see in, within the same time frame from boxing B2 secretion. But when you destroy those macrophages, again, everything disappears. And yet we had no complement activation. And again, that goes back to the old story that pulmonary intravascular macrophages are very efficient in clearing of the particles. And what you need to understand is what are those receptors that participate in this type of signaling? And that would be maybe the key for the human cases. Again, uh, supporting information goes back to an, uh, an, a very old study with intravenous lipid emulsion, which is given to millions of people. We have never seen uh, adverse reaction to that. But again, when it was given into the pig, and there was a massive reactions again in the pig, and the pig actually responds. And again, the conclusion from this study was the pig is not an ideal model for the study of intravenous uh, inter intervention involving uh, intravenous lipid emulsion. So we cannot just having a standard saying that pig is good in one model, then pig is not good in one another model. Now, I do not agree with the philosophy that pig is a model of the human disease. Pig is a healthy animal, is a healthy physiological condition. 
but it's a different physiology. So it cannot represent a human disease. So my question to the regulatory bodies are, if you would have injected the COVID vaccines intravenously into the pig and you're seeing these massive reactions, would you actually approve that for human use? Yet we have seen hardly any anaphylactic reactions or anaphylactoid reactions with this type of particles in human subjects which have received, you know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. So other possible mechanisms are the pro-inflammatory nature of the lipid nanoparticles. And I just make, draw your attention to two recent studies in eye science and nature immunology that have identified the ionizable lipids as an adjuvant. And that is very important because you get a high ILB secretion, but very low level of IL-1 alpha and IL-1 alpha receptor antagonists. We have actually published a recent uh, editorial in molecular therapy, which is just online discussing this paper and the importance of this paper and actually show a massive difference in terms of the response between murine and even non-human primate. So it could be that a pro-inflammatory reaction is happening because of the ionizable lipids and because of the generation of many danger signals such as activation of a whole range of uh, intracellular pattern recognition receptors, activation of the inflammasome and so on. So on that basis, we also have to be very careful in terms of studying the LNP-mediated tissue damage and inflammation and secretion of IL-33 and activation of the ST2 receptors on Rg-sensitized mast cells. And again, mastocytosis could be very important because the prevalence is very, very, uh, again, low on maybe those individuals with a high level of mast cells or maybe even neutrophils or basophils locally could be responding to these uh, LNP and the danger signal which are secreted from uh, those cells or the damage to those cells that have taken off LNPs. So LNPs are actually adjuvants and ionizable lipids are actually adjuvants. So on that basis, recently again, uh, Panos was uh, presenting this, this data yesterday that we have shown the dendromer because of the uh, spacing arrangement of the N-terminal can be modulated in such a way that we can control their interaction with different type of pattern recognition molecules. And if they are involved in these type of inflammatory reactions, maybe dendrimers could be the solution for uh, functionalizing the surfaces of LNPs or even making LNP or, or making even dendrometic based vaccines uh, for this type of mRNA delivery to the, to the cells. So, one of the speakers today actually showed that uh, slides from the European Medicine Agency. So basically, I would like to actually draw the attention of the European Medicine Agency. We are well, well over the time. I'm, this is my last slide. To actually consider their statement, what they're actually saying, and should be backed up by solid evidence. So finally, I just uh, pass acknowledgement to, to many of the people who contributed to this work in, in different ways. And, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moeen. Um, unfortunately, there is a uh, half an hour delay relative to the uh, original schedule. So I have to um, <clears throat> introduce you the next speaker, uh, who is um, <clears throat> Dr. Anne Catherine Hartman from the Department of Medicine, Hematology, Oncology, Num uh, Pneumology from the University Medical Center of the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. Germany. Uh, Dr. Hartmann, uh, please, um, the word is yours. So uh, thank you very much for the nice introductory words and the opportunity to present my data here on this conference. And I, I now uh, uh, share my screen. So, okay. So uh, welcome from my side, and here I will like to introduce you to our new model, Ditranol, as a novel co-adjuvant for transcutaneous immunization. And um, uh, vaccinations are undoubtedly uh, the most successful medical intervention in the modern history. And in this context, the needle-free administration of vaccines came into the focus of the researchers. And, um, there are several methods that uh, we can use for the transcutaneous immunization. So needle-free um, methods here, the injection techniques, but we are here focusing on the passive approaches. 
Um, there are some advantages over the common used needle free um, uh, over, over the common use needle based techniques so the needle free applications uh, they don't need a cannula so we have the needle phobias can be avoided um, probably I can take this so and there's no medical trained staff that is necessary and we can uh, make self medication um, we avoid needle uh, based accidents because of uh, needle stick injuries and that induces massively the follow up cost for the healthcare system. So I have a question. Can, can you see my slides really good? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, in contrast to other um, needle based techniques, the transcutaneous immunization abroad um, directly target skin resident antigen presenting cells. And so uh, we are able to generate a cellular immune response and that is needed for the protection against infectious diseases. And that enables also the therapeutic usage. But I have to say that today, there is no approved transcutaneous vaccine that is used in the clinic. And the transcutaneous um, uh, immunization abroad, uh, we use ovalbumin peptides uh, applied together with the Miquima, that is a TLR7 agonist, um, onto the intact skin of the mice. And TLRC, uh, um, Miquima acts via the TLR7 and um, acts via the MIDI88 pathway and, and uses the, um, the production of pro inflammatory cytokines. In this context, immune cells infiltrate into the skin. And the peptides um, can be transported via passive transport and through the uh, training lymph nodes. And um, they can be taken up by dendritic cells and they maturate and migrate into the training lymph nodes where the antigens get presented to, to naive T cells. And we have a clonal expansion of antigen specific T cells. So, um, in the year 2005, we first published a paper about our transcutaneous immunization abroad using a Miquimod as an adjuvant. And since this time point, we would like to optimize this um, immunization strategy. And, and because there are several um, yeah, disadvantages of this strategy. Um, in cooperation with the Institute of Pharmacy, we um, we were able to generate our, new, our own imiquimod formulation here, the imison, that is a freeze-dried nano emulsion. And um, this uh, induces uh, a good uh, CDA T cell responses, but um, we need to um, apply this uh, cream on a large area of the mice. So we have to shave the back skin of the mice and then apply the, the formulation. And this formulation only induces the weak CD4 uh, T cell response and an insufficient memory response. And so in this context, we, um, we were searching for new adjuvants for our transcutaneous immunization approach. And we found one that is the Detranol, that is the dehydroxyantron. Um, and we apply it together um, with the Miquimod and the peptides on the skin. Detranol is associated with the generation of ROS, and it is one of the most prominent uh, drug for the treatment of, of, of psoriasis. Um, it induces a skin infl inflammation, but um, the effects of the um, Detranol on the skin is, is not fully understood. And so we, um, yeah. We, uh, we use Detranol as a new potential adjuvant for our transcutaneous immunization approach. And in the first step, we um, try to overcome one disadvantage because we uh, downscale the area that we need for immunization. So we just uh, apply the, our imiquimod and Detranol formulations on the ears of the mice. So um, we wanted to determine the effects of detranol on the T cell priming, and for that we apply detranol first um, on the on the ears of the mice, and in the second step the uh, imiquimod, and we follow up the generation of antigen specific T cells over the time using this tetramer stainings here, and you can nicely see that when we have a combined application of detranol and imiquimod, we were able to. Um, to generate antigen specific T cells with a maximum on day 14. And we were able to see memory responses, CD8 memory responses. 
And we look, uh, and when we look in the memory phase, um, and we re-stimulate um, the spleen cells with CD8 or CD4 peptides, um, we can and you or we can find interferon gamma producing um, CD4 and CD8 specific T cells. So. Um, um, the DIVA approach is able to overcome the disadvantages of the Miquimod approach because we uh, were able to generate CD4 responses and also sufficient memory responses. And after showing that uh, DIVA introduces a peptide specific memory response, we next address the question whether we need the CD4 T cells um, in the primary phase to generate this memory response. And in this context, we use an antibody to deplete the CD4 T cells and we looked in the memory phase. And um, you can see that um, um, by the treatment with the um, CD4 depleted, uh, depleted a depleting antibody, the DIVA effect is diminished um, in the amount of antigen specific T cells, and also the interferon gamma production here is reduced even um, for the CD8 T cells as well as the CD4 T cells um, in the memory phase. And so we can conclude that um, uh, we need the CD4 T cells for um, the DIVA effect in the memory phase. And as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, um, Dichanul induces a skin irritation or skin inflammation reaction. And as we apply both adjuvants, Dichanul and Imicrimod, um, onto the skin, we want to figure out the effects uh, of these drugs uh, on the infiltrating cells on the skin. And so we um, apply the drugs on the on the ears of the mice, and we followed up um, what happens 24 hours, 48 hours, or 72 hours after the application in the skin. And for that, we isolate the ears and um, isolated CD45 positive cells from this um, skin slices. And um, the most prominent uh, leukocyte population that was measured uh, 24 hours um, after the Ditranol treatment here in PLEC are the monocytes. And the most prominent population um, that, was, um, that we can find after the Viquimod treatment were the, the granulocytes. And as uh, macrophages and other monocytic populations are important to mediate um, immune activation and play a crucial role in the formation of uh, um, specific T cells. We also analyzed um, these uh, populations in the skin, and we can also observe here that at, at all time points, we have an increase of monocyte derived dendritic cells in the skin after detrinal treatment, and also an increase of macrophages um, after detrinal treatment. And we also looked in the lymph nodes, um, 72 hours after the detranol or amicumor treatment. And we can see that there is an enhanced frequency of macrophages when we um, treat the mice with detranol or the combined application of uh, detranol and amicumor. And also um, an infiltration of monocyte-derived uh, dendritic cells. And we have an enhanced expression of the co-stimulatory molecules. So um, we, we hypothesize that the effects of the uh, detranol um, yeah, helps um, for the uh, formation of um, antigen-specific T cells and they help, um, um, yeah, they have the activation and they have the effect that is induced um, by a micromod. And um, in this context, um, we wanted to really to figure out if you really need um, um, the infiltration of monocytes for the adjuvant effect of um, detranol. And for that, um, we deplete um, uh, CCR2 positive cells with the, this antibody here, MCR21, or with the isotype, um, prior the uh, DIVA treatment. And um, then we looked uh, in the primary moon phase at the amount of antigen-specific T cells. And you, you can see here that the, the isotype has no effect on the frequency of antigen-specific T cells. And the um, the depletion antibody MC21 has a significant effect. So we have an, a real 
um, reduction of antigen-specific T cells when we um, prior uh, deplete the uh, monocytes. And also the interferon gamma production here is significantly reduced. So, and as I mentioned in the beginning, um, the mechanism that um, what, um, did, 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 what did it renal induces um, in the skin are not fully understood, but um, um, the detrinal um, action is associated with ROS. And so um, in this context, we hypothesize that the oxidative potential of detrinol is also necessary for its adjuvant effect. And to confirm this, um, we apply detrinol onto the um, ear skin. And prior to this, we treat the mice with alpha tocopherol. That is an antioxidant that um, uh, might uh, antagonize the oxidative effects of the detrinol. And then we looked um, um, 24 hours later, we looked at, in the skin again. So here are the infiltrating monocytes of the detrinol treatment. And here is uh, the monocytes shown after um, tocopherol uh, treatment prior to the detrinol treatment. And you can see uh, nicely see that the infiltration here is uh, diminished. And we also uh, looked at the effect on the transcutaneous immunization here. So first we apply the detrinol on the ears and then the micromod together with the peptides. And prior each application, we um, inject alpha tocopherol into peritoneali. And we looked in the primary moon phase. And here are the um, here is the, the effector function of the CD8 positive T cells uh, displayed. So it is measured in the specific lysis of the cells. And um, that is the capacity of the CD8 positive T cells to, um, to recognize um, antigen loaded target cells and to uh, lyse these cells. And, um, when we look here, or when we compare these two groups, so the DIVA-treated mice and the DIVA-treated mice in com combination with tocopherol, the effector function of the antigen-specific T cells is diminished. So uh, we claim that the oxidative potential that is um, um, uh, induced to DDD-tranol is uh, crucial for its adjuvant effect. And to take and taking this all together, we can say that um, we here present detrenol as a new adjuvant for transcutaneous immunization. And in combination with uh, ovalbumin peptides, any micromod, it overcomes the disadvantages uh, from the micromod treatment alone. So we were able to reduce the skin surface area that we need for immunization. We were able to induce a real CD4 and CD8 memory response here. We have an infiltration of monocytes and macrophages in the skin that are crucial for this effect. And um, oxidative mechanisms uh, play a crucial role in this process. And here uh, I come to my last slide where I would like to conclude uh, that our new approach DIVA um, might be a new vaccination platform for transdermal uh, peptide uh, vaccines because it harvests many advantages of a next um, generation vaccine because its application is very easy uh, and safe because it's the application on the intact skin. We don't need no um, medical personal for this so we can um, apply it on our own. So it's, uh, um, used, it can be used for self-application and for mass vaccination program. And um, one advantage is that we use well-defined and fully synthetic ingredients um, with well-known safety profiles in humans. And we can translate it to other defined peptides. So we can use our DIVA approach for the, uh, for the, um, for the formation of new vaccines again against viral infection, for instance, influenza, hepatitis, or coronaviruses. But the challenge um, we are focusing now is that we have to translate it into the human system. And so I'm at the end of my talk, and I would like to um, thank you for your attention. I would like to thank all my collaborators and my supervising, and my supervising uh, team. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hartman. Fantastic presentation. Um, 
I would like to, uh, we have to leave this room. Uh, I would like to thank uh, you and I would like to thank all speakers for the uh, wonderful presentations. And uh, I would like to invite everyone to please join debate room one. Uh, the organizers put the Zoom link uh, with the meeting ID and code in the chat box. So if you please uh, check the chat box, you will see the uh, um, uh, new Zoom link. So we'll see everyone in a moment. We just need to go to another virtual uh, place. Okay, and then we'll do the discussion from there. Um, see everyone in a minute. Thank you.